Today on 10 Minute IT Gems, we're joined by Nico Van Sommeren, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Absolute Software. Absolute Software empowers mission critical performance with advanced cyber resilience. Embedded in more than 600 million devices, the company's cyber resilience platform delivers endpoint to network access security coverage, ensures automated security compliance, and enables operational continuity. Nico joins us today to tell us more about Absolute Software and some of his thoughts on the limitations and opportunities around AI and cyber. Thank you for coming along, Nico, and welcome to the jam. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, well, let's just get straight into it. For a business that hasn't worked with Absolute Software before, what are your key products and offerings? So uh, Absolute Software has a range of products, but they fall into two categories. Uh, one set is about providing security for uh, endpoint computers, PCs, Macintoshes, and so forth. Uh, the other line is for uh, providing secure access technology. So uh, on the secure access side, we have a, a technology which uh, these days we refer to as a ZTNA, so Zero Trust Network Access Platform. Uh, it's... Uh, based on some actually very advanced uh, uh, VPN technology that has been in development for many years, uh, with, but with the added capabilities beyond what you typically expect of a VPN of having uh, uh, very powerful error correction and flow control and network continuity support so that you get a very continuous connection even when you roam between different cellular providers or between cellular and uh, Wi-Fi or from one Wi-Fi to the next. And that combination of error correction and uh, uh, session resilience gives you a very reliable, continuous connection. But we also couple that with very rich monitoring of the traffic that flows across those network links. It gives you uh, not only great analytics into what your users are using it for, but also uh, allows you to do a great deal of security monitoring and uh, threat prevention. And then couple this again with capabilities to uh, provide uh, rich authentication and uh, policy control based on context. Um, the secure endpoint technology is uh, a, a suite of technology that provides visibility and control and resilience to endpoint computers like PCs. Um, that's actually based on some technology that's built down in the BIOS of uh, hundreds of millions of PCs that have shipped worldwide. We work with most of the PC OEM vendors uh, to put our BIOS component into the ROMs of the machines before they even ship. It sits dormant until we send it a cryptographically signed message that says, wake up and attach yourself to this particular customer. And when it does that, after that, whenever that machine boots, our agent software will be taken from that BIOS ROM, handed to the Windows kernel, and when Windows starts, that agent will be amongst the first things to run. That primacy of boot sequence gives us this powerful vantage point for uh, watching what your device is doing and giving you insights into what your fleet of computers are doing, how they're behaving. Also, how is the software on them behaving? You can collect telemetry about what software is installed, what hardware is deployed, um, find out not just what applications are on there, but are they running? Are they correctly configured? Are they actually working as expected? That visibility is then coupled with some control capabilities, which let you reach out to those machines, uh, run repair scripts if necessary, uh, deploy new software, have, uh, and generally manage those devices in a remote way. And that reach out functionality is that even if the device gets re-imaged, because our software is coming out of the BIOS ROM, uh, that uh, device and that capability, that's very resilient to, to attack. If the software is removed from the OS, it'll come back out of the BIOS. If the OS is, if the device is re-imaged, then it will still come back out of the BIOS. That means that this visibility that we give you 
is powerful for things like tracking and tracing the device if it's stolen. If it's stolen, uh, one of the first things that thieves do now is they will, uh, after they've checked to see if the device has any valuable data, they'll just wipe it. They want to get rid of all trace of the original owner. Um, even when they do that, that will remove most security tools, but it won't remove us because we come back up out of the BIOS. Well, now, what trends are you seeing in secure access and secure endpoints? So I think on the secure access front, there is uh, an increasing concern that with uh, the hybrid work model, uh, we have users in more and more places. So, and I think that we've been seeing the, the incipient death of the perimeter security model for a long time. And I think that we can, uh, you know, definitely say that that's something that people have uh, largely, but not entirely, ceased to 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 worry about. Um, but at the same time, I think over the last few years, we've probably seen that, uh, you know, if you asked many IT operators five years ago, um, you know. Will you move everything into the cloud? You might have got a lot of people saying, yes, we expect in the end we will. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing uh, organizations saying, no, actually, there are some things we will always keep within the firewall. And we will always have a firewall to keep it within. Um, so that means that we now have a, a hybrid at both ends model. We have hybrid work for our users. Some are in the office, some are out in the field um, or working from home or remotely. Um, and then we have some services that are in the office and some that are in the, the cloud. And we need a very rich network access solution to mediate and secure those connections and work out what is an appropriate connection in a given context, in a given circumstance, for, between a set of points. So that high visibility, high uh, sophistication of policy uh, is really necessary for doing uh, securing access in, in the modern world. On the end point, I think that we're definitely seeing more interest in cyber resilience. We've reached a point of diminishing return in a lot of sorts of spend on endpoint security. Um, you know, we've been seeing people piling on more and more security controls onto their endpoints. Um, but it's sort of like, you know, if I buy a, a spend twice as much on a hi-fi, it won't sound twice as good. If I spend twice as much on a car, it won't go twice as fast. Uh, you know, we reach a point of diminishing return where we can squeeze the 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 risk down so far by, but we can't squeeze it any further by piling on more controls. But risk has two dimensions. You know, there's the probability of attack and there's the impact of the attack. The other dimension is about how long does it take to recover, about how damaging is any individual attack. And so we're now seeing more interest in what can you do to squeeze the other dimension, to bring down the impact of attacks rather than the probability of attacks. And so a lot of that turns out in practice to be about how quickly can you recover? Uh, one of the biggest problems that companies face in practice is things like ransomware or malware that is destructive to an endpoint. And so recovery is very much about how fast can you uh, rebuild that endpoint? Um, how fast can we get the correct security controls on there again, make sure that they're working again, make sure that they remove the malware, make sure we get that into a working state. Well, shifting tech a little bit, what role do you think AI can play in cybersecurity operations? So uh, the number of times I've been asked that in the last year, I, I've, I've long lost count. Uh, you know, AI has captured the imagination of, uh, of the, uh, the whole world, not just the technology world in the last year. Um, and so 
I, I think I have a, a, a somewhat contrary view on this compared to many. I think that uh, a lot of people believe that, you know, AI is the future of everything. It's a complete panacea. Uh, we're all going to be replaced by automation. Uh, and in fact, you're not interviewing me. You're just interviewing chat GPT. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, having actually been working in the field of machine learning and, uh, you know, I 30 years ago did a PhD in neural networks. Uh, so I, I, I believe I have some, uh, some, some insight into this. Um, I think that we need to be looking at modern AI and machine learning, things like large language models, as just another tool in an ever expanding toolbox. Uh, you know, technology always can continues apace. Uh, you know, generally the the rate of new technology creation is pretty much proportional to the amount of technology we have already. Um, and actually, if you ask a mathematician what's a curve that has a slope that's proportional to its current height, that's actually the definition of an exponential curve. So you know. Uh, uh, technology has been expanding at an exponential rate forever, uh, and this isn't something new. Uh, we've seen some significant advances in a particular field of AI in terms of large language models in the last few years, uh, primarily driven by access to very, very large arrays of uh, GPUs and uh, other sort of AI processing units that allow us to process more data. You know, the fundamental model in GPT has been around for five or six years, but it's bigger. It was trained on more data. People threw more money at it. And actually the big step that happened with it, um, with OpenAI and ChatGPT was not the technology under the hood, but making it freely available to everybody through ChatGPT's chat interface and making it very easy to use. Uh, the technology has been around for a while. Um, it's horribly expensive to run that technology, and ChatGPT is losing money hand over fist, um, but it's captured an awful lot of imagination in the process. So what does this actually mean for cybersecurity? Um, you know, I think that there was a lot of concern when it first came out and people saw that it could write code, that, uh, you know, script kiddies would be using this to create new attacks. Um, it's important to understand that while these systems exhibit a fair amount of general knowledge, they don't exhibit general intelligence. And they're actually not very creative. They're good at coming up with very derivative answers. So if you want something to to cobble together pieces that it's seen before it can do a, a job a, a, a reasonable job at that but in practice if you if you ask it to write anything even faintly complex you'll find that the code tends not to work and even with the latest models where you can actually say you know write me some code then then go and test the code and then look at the errors and then rewrite the code accordingly, it still doesn't do a terribly good job. Um, and so uh, I don't think that we're going to be seeing AI as a tool used by the bad people to, to generate new attacks. There is some chance that it will get moderately good at, uh, at regurgitating attacks that are out there already. Uh, but Hopefully you'll have patched those already. Uh, you know, we, I actually still believe that that you know patching your machines is probably the the single most important thing you could do to improve the security of your your organization. Very interesting take. I don't think I've heard that one before. It's interesting. Uh, well, I guess one last question to finish off: How should organizations allocate their resources between cyber defense and response? Well, I, that's a that's a perennial question. Uh, as a, of course, as a as a as a totally impartial vendor of of resilience tools, I, I clearly think that everybody should be spending vastly more on on resilience. But no, seriously, uh, the as I mentioned before, I think you know this sort of diminishing return that we're seeing on defense does suggest that 
actually a rebalancing towards response, towards reducing impact, uh, is probably a better way to spend our funds. Uh, you know, we, we if we are, uh, you know, expecting that at least some of the attacks will get through, then we have to spend some time thinking about the response. And we know that even one breach on one endpoint can lead to onward propagation inside your organization. And so, so we're never going to get our risk of breach down to zero. And if we have a security model that's going to allow for lateral movement at all, then we're in trouble. We've got to, we've got to do better at containing and better at responding. Um, and if that means taking some of the spend away from prevention in order to do that, that's probably going to allow us to reduce the risk to our organization overall. And so I do think that there's an increasing trend towards rebalancing uh, to, to prioritize, not, I mean, not saying deprioritize uh, defense so much as give more weight to the response side because that that will you know if we've got a a, a a area of a rectangle whose width is the the probability of success and the height is uh, the impact uh, we may be better off bringing down that height than trying to squeeze the width anymore. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on the jam, Nico, and learning more about Absolute Software. And hearing some of your insights been very very interesting. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from Absolute Software very soon. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.